If we have to raise interest rates more over time, we will. I do not believe we have an ethics problem. We'll be normalizing policy, meaning we're going to end our asset purchases in March. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacroix. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London, and here is coming up on today's program. Jay Powell vows to keep inflation in check with key CPI data out today. Consensus says the December print may hit 7%. Boris Johnson also under pressure over Partygate. This afternoon, MPs will question the Prime Minister over lockdown breaking gathering allegations. And, of course, stay with Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. This hour, we have an amazing lineup of guests. We also speak to the special representative of the President of Kazakhstan for international cooperation. Send in your questions on IB Plus TV Go. Now, first thing is first, uh, we do have quite a lot of buoyancy on the markets. We're seeing a nice lift off when it comes to some of the European stocks gaining some three tenths of a percent. A couple of stories there that we need to watch out for. First, it's all about CPI, but also we had a reading in inflation in China, which could mean that we're seeing a little bit more or less hawkishness, I would say, from China. That was one of the biggest concerns overall for investors. The other big story is, of course, the U.S. 10-year yield. We could look at the 10-year yield every 10 minutes just because it gives us a good indication of what uh, the, uh, the um, flattening yield curve does next. And at the moment, still flattening 174.10. Uh, Treasuries did find also a little bit of support after a solid three-year note sale. And the Natural gas, always a good way of looking how much pressure we have in terms of consumer prices gaining some 4.1 percent. Now, the story here in the UK, watch out for any political news. It's today that Boris Johnson has to face uh, MPs to try and answer allegations on whether he was at a party or not. A lot of market participants saying, like, look, he knows if he was at the party or not. What doesn't he just come out and say it instead of waiting? For that investigation, and you can see the CAC 40 and the DAX gaining around one tenth of 8%. Now, the Federal Reserve Chair, Jay Powell, says the central bank won't hesitate to act if needed to contain inflation and help ensure full employment. Now, Powell spoke yesterday at his confirmation hearing before the Senate Banking Committee, and he was assuring Congress that 2022 was really an important year for normalization of Fed policy. We, and essentially all other mainstream forecasters, forecasted that, that by now we'd be seeing much lower inflation. And that, that's, that's not what happened. The economy no longer needs or wants the very highly accommodative policies that we've had in place to deal with the pandemic and the aftermath. We'll be normalizing policy, meaning we're going to end our asset purchases in March, meaning we'll be raising rates over the course of the year. If we have to raise interest rates more over time, we will. At some point, perhaps later this year, we will start to allow the balance sheet to run off. It is really time for us to begin to move away from those emergency pandemic settings to a more normal level. But it's a long road to normal from where we are. So to more on the markets and that CPI print later today, we're joined by Swetha Ramachadran, Global Equities Investment Manager at GAM, and our markets editor, Christine Aquino. So thank you both for joining us. Christine, it was really important that, look, the Fed chair was at pains in saying, look, we'll deal with inflation and we won't hurt the economy. I mean, in theory, that's all well and fine, but actually it's going to be very tricky to have that balance. Absolutely, Francine. And you know what really struck me most about his comments to uh, in his testimony yesterday was it wasn't necessarily a signal to markets to expect less than what the Fed had already indicated in terms of what they're going to do. And that's a very important distinction because I think, you know, some of the buoyancy in markets we're seeing today is probably down to maybe expectations that, oh, maybe they might slow down or not do as much, but we didn't really get that indication. So I think, um, uh, if anything, maybe it's a signal for markets to maybe not build on what's already yeah. priced in, which is about three to four rate hikes, but definitely not a climb down from what's already been into markets at this point. Yeah, so Swetha, what do you think is actually moving the markets today? Because there's another line of thought, and we spoke to someone at UBS yesterday saying, look, what the market is also worrying about is, of course, what we're seeing in terms of inflation in China, meaning that we could really have a PBOC that's more hawkish than the rest of the economy or the rest of the world warrants it. So we had some inflation print today in China, which could be supportive of a more accommodative PBOC. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think the key comment from uh, Mr. Powell's comments yesterday were the long road to normal, because I think there had been maybe some fears that actually the balance sheet runoff would occur earlier in the year, and that's firmly been put back, which obviously was supportive for equity markets overall. Uh, in China, it does appear that slowing growth will lead to a more accommodative stance 
from the uh, central bank overall, uh, particularly in fiscal policy as well as monetary policy. We're seeing very early signs of that come through. For instance, uh, the property tax that was mooted to be put through this year has possibly been pushed back on worries over the wider economy. So uh, the key really going forward is this uh, narrative that the central banks are not necessarily as behind the curve on fighting inflation and that they can manage it with the tools at their disposal. Uh, so that, let me bring you to a chart that actually is one of my favorite charts, so definitely of the day. Thank you, Valerie, for putting it together. And it really looks at the valuations, for example, between UK stocks, European stocks, and some of the US ones. If you know, if you're a European stock, you're probably cheaper for a reason, Swetha. But this is this the year where you actually could outperform or you know run better than, for example, US equities. Uh, so the expectations for U.S. equities clearly appear more elevated than those for international equities, and that clearly could be the driver this year, we think, for Europe to outperform relative to uh, uh, relative to the U.S. market. The other factor is that uh, the U.S. market is also quite tech-heavy, and those are the stocks that are at the front line of the rising yield environment, where perhaps their uh, the elevated discount rates means that their cash flows are not necessarily as appealing going forward. Uh, Europe is underpenetrated in those types of stocks is possibly a little more old economy value type stocks which tend to do well in this type of rotation. And uh, Christine, I know one of your favorite charts today is actually looking at some of the currency, some of the currency moves and actually what that means for cross assets. Absolutely, Francine. And I think it's going to be a really interesting year, especially for currency and currency volatility, because we are coming to a year when, yes, generally a lot of central banks are moving toward tightening, but we do have still divergences in terms of speed. And of course, the fact that China is going its own way and uh, turning a little bit more dovish potentially while the rest of the world turns hawkish. And so so I think that's really going to throw up some very interesting divergences when it comes to the path of currency direction, as well as how much they're swinging relative to each other this year. Yeah, and so is that also true for, for example, UK stocks? We have another great chart looking at, for example, you know, the FTSE compared to some of the other ones. Yeah, the UK stocks have clearly been uh, very beaten up uh, post-Brexit, have uh, underperformed for sort of five consecutive years. Uh, there could be signs, particularly given the energy-intensive nature of the FTSE 100, uh, that that could reverse this year as uh, energy stocks come back into favor, as do financials, again, uh, a sector that the FTSE 100 is heavily exposed to. What is the one thing, um, Christine, that, that market worries? I mean, look, CPI is a huge, huge, huge deal, but I feel like we've been talking about it for such a long time. Unless it's you know, significantly lower than expected, does it move expectations for the Fed at all? I think what will, it will do is essentially kind of cement or maybe challenge the notion in markets at the moment in terms of its interpretation of um, how fast the Fed is going to be um, able to go in terms of tightening and also in terms of their options. I mean, we're talking about potential uh, simultaneous balance sheet runoff and rate hikes at the same time. And you can imagine a situation like that, especially if the CPI print warrants it, could necessar uh, wouldn't necessarily be great for risk assets. Meanwhile, on the other hand, if it's a little bit of a softer print, then perhaps mm -hmm. investors uh, could, can have more room for interpretation in terms of the, the Fed's options for policy tightening and a little bit of uh, divergence there in terms of what they're going to do next. All right. Uh, Swetha, I'll ask you a little bit more about that shortly. Christina Aquino and Swetha Ramachadran, a global equities investment manager at GAM, stays with us. Now, Smart Conversations continue on the Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition this hour. We also speak about the unrest in Kazakhstan with a special representative of the country's president. But before then, and we discuss commodities with BlackRock's Evie Hambro. You can send in your questions on IB plus TV Go. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, we've had two key pieces of news on China this morning. Inflation moderated last month, fueling speculation that the PBOC will cut rates. Goldman also lowered its growth forecast for the year. Now, for more on all of this, we're joined by James Maker in Beijing. So, James, what's the outlook for China's economy and what's weighing down growth? You know, since the start of the new year, we've seen a steady sort of stream of, of investment banks cutting their forecast for, for this year. You know, Goldman was 
Nobody is also at 4.3. Some other people are at 4 percent for you know for growth for the whole year, which is really you know which is would be the weakest growth since since the pandemic outbreak in 2020. And also, it's it's much lower than you know what we expect the government is going to set as their growth target for this year, which is probably going to be five between five and six percent. So you know the expectation is that with the you know growing COVID outbreaks in China. And, the, and that is going to weigh on growth, and the government is therefore going to have to step in with both fiscal stimulus, which they're already sort of putting into place, but also monetary stimulus. And there is an expectation, a growing expectation, that that could come as early as next week, with Monday being seen as the day when the PBOC might actually uh, add fiscal stimulus by cutting rates. Right. And that, I imagine, James, would be supportive for the rest of the world as well, right? Right. Uh, yeah, it's not only going to be supportive for Chinese growth, but also obviously for Chinese demand for overseas uh, you know, commodity imports and, and other things. So, you know, if, if the difference between a 4 percent growth and a 5 percent growth for, chi for China's economy is going to be substantial for, you know, for countries like Australia, uh, you know, America, Canada, which are exporting commodities to, to China. But also and also but that's also going to be helpful for uh, companies that are importing from China as well. You know. All right, James, thank you so much. James Mager there in Beijing. Now we're back with Sweta Ramachandran, a global equities investment manager at GAM. And Sweta, we were talking a little bit about China and some of the difference that, you know, higher or lower inflation print means uh, to your asset allocation. But what are you expecting from the U.S. CPI today? Uh, I think the widely uh, the expectation is that we will see probably the highest CPI print that we have seen for some time, a headline inflation of about 7%. Uh, while this will sound dramatic, this has already been quite well flagged uh, by policymakers, so it shouldn't necessarily come as an incremental surprise. So, uh, Swetha, when you look at some of the emerging markets, I don't know whether there's opportunity there or you, you still remain a little bit uncertain given what the Fed could do. Uh, it is true that, for instance, uh, you know, Chinese stocks in the wake of the regulatory crackdown last year are starting to look much more appealing in terms of valuation, and there's definitely opportunity there. Uh, I do think the first leg of recovery will be in that very brutal so sell-off that we saw in some global high-quality stocks, which have been sold off uh, indiscriminately with some more speculative, unprofitable companies, for instance. And those companies will be the first to recover, in my view, now that the uh, rate of increase in bond yields appears to have moderated. And I think that will be the key driver of benefiting the quality compounders, particularly those listed in Europe. So, Swetha, what are you expecting from earnings season and what are your favorite sectors to be invested in? Uh, I do think uh, this is where perhaps the trade between the European and U.S. equities will become much more prominent and that European equities are probably baking in a lot less in terms of expectations heading into earnings season. And I do think some sectors, for instance, like travel and leisure, which have been very badly beaten up, now that Omicron is likely, has shown itself perhaps not to be as virulent as the previous strains and that if we get through it by the end of the first quarter of 2022, there's a lot of pent-up demand for travel which should benefit these companies and these stocks. Uh, so I'm quite optimistic on travel and leisure overall as economies reopen and we see some evidence of a shift away from goods back into services. Yeah, I know you also look at, for example, the pricing power of certain you know, big conglomerates to see whether they can raise prices. Th that links it back to inflation, given we could be, well, feeling poor or if inflation goes up and your wage doesn't increase. So are, are there big multinationals that you like more than others? Yeah, I would say pricing power where it focuses on products that have low elasticity of demand. Uh, unlike, say, staples, for instance, uh, where there is really decent elasticity of demand, some higher-end consumer products and brands, particularly in the luxury area, have much lower elasticity and are able to pass through price increases much more successfully uh, to a global cohort of clients that appears willing to spend at this point in time. So I think companies that are exposed to that higher-end consumer, I would count, for instance, Estee Lauder or LVMH, among this camp. These are companies that have been affected in the recent growth sell-off. But I think unfairly, given that they're uh, under-leveraged financially, which protects them from rising rates uh, and also have strong pricing power, which again uh, helps them in inflationary times, uh, that their earnings resilience should shine through in the coming earnings season. Um, so with our, our question of the day is really how much will ESG impact markets in 2022? How difficult or what's your read on that? 
Uh, ESG has certainly been a very dominant theme in 2021. Uh, one could argue that in certain assets, perhaps it's gone a bit too far and that we're maybe uh, due somewhat of a little bit of a retreat. Longer term, the trend is definitely very clear that uh, ESG is going to dominate an increasing proportion of uh, fund managers' assets under management. In the short term, we may see a little bit of a wobble as this current volatility works its way through. Uh, but I think long term, the direction of travel is quite clear for ESG. So, thank you so much for joining us with our Ramachandran, their Global Equities Investment Manager at GAM, for all of her insight on markets in 2022. Now, let's get straight to the Bloomberg. First word news, here's Leanne Garrens. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. France has registered more than 368,000 daily COVID-19 infections, a new record as the Omicron variant continues its spread across the country. Meanwhile, the Canadian province of Quebec is reported to be planning a new health tax on those who are not vaccinated. Quebec's Premier says that 10% of unvaccinated adults represent 50% of people in intensive care beds. EU regulators are warning that frequent COVID-19 booster vaccines could adversely affect the immune system and may not be feasible. The European Medicines Agency says repeat doses every four months could eventually weaken people's immune systems. They want more time between booster programs tied to the onset of cold weather. Israel has already given and about 400,000 people a fourth dose. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerens. This is Bloomberg Francie. Leanne, thanks so much. Coming up, a party too far. Will Boris Johnson under fire once again for a party which he may or may not have attended in the first UK lockdown? The Prime Minister should know if he was there, but he hasn't said whether he was yet. He gets questions by lawmakers at Prime Minister Questions today. That story up next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, is under pressure yet again due to the latest party scandal. Currently, he's under investigation for previous scandals. Now, he allegedly attended a bring-your-own-bottle party in 2020, May 2020, during the first lockdown. Having already witnessed dissent within his party last month over Plan B pandemic restrictions, Johnson is now under fire both from voters and his own party. Well, joining us now to discuss all of this is Bloomberg's Alex Morales. Alex, I have to say good morning, first of all. I mean, this is pretty incredible uh, a story when the prime minister doesn't even or hasn't so far said whether he was at the party or not. Is this a latest scandal that's just a party too far for Boris Johnson? Will he have to resign over this? Well, Francine, I think that's the question on everyone's lips. I mean, we, uh, you know, there was a steady drip, drip, drip of all these parties emerging um, towards the end of last year, um, and the prime minister seemed to survive that, and he'd hoped to begin this year with a with a bit of a reset um, to sort of refocus his government on actually um, getting some policy um, announcements out. Um, and then this latest party um, uh, ad, um, allegation has emerged. Um, it was sparked last week by um, his former top aide, um, Dominic Cummings, said people should look into this. Um, and of course, people did. Yeah. Um, and ITV obtained that email over the weekend, um, which seems to have shown something like 100 people being invited to a, a bring your own uh, booze um, event in the Downing Street Garden. Um, and, it, and it really does. This looks like the most serious of them all, um, especially as um, there's a strong sense that the prime minister may have actually attended this one. Yes, yeah, so, and he's been asked this repeatedly by various media outlets over the week, and he hasn't managed to say whether he was at the party, yes or no. I mean, what, you know, f first of all, if we were in lockdown and he was there, that's very tricky to justify. But also, he had said to Parliament in the past that there were no other parties. Yeah, I mean, he's, stone, he's, he's stonewalled questions this week. Um, I can't remember the exact context of his no other parties comments, because it may have just been referring to Christmas 2020, um, if you're being generous to him. All right. Um, but certainly, th this latest one on May the 20th, 2020, seems to have been at the height of um, the strictest of the lockdowns, uh, when you could only meet one other person outside. Um, I'm, I'm not even sure if you're allowed to eat in the presence of that other person. <laughs> um, 
And if the Prime Minister attended it, a, a party such as that, it looks very serious because it would appear to be in breach of the, the, the laws that he himself made. Um, so a lot, a lot rests on um, the Cabinet Office investigation that's going on. There's a very senior civil servant, Sue Gray, who's looking at all these parties. Um, but also whether, whether she has to refer, ends up referring some of this to the Metropolitan Police um, yeah. for police investigation, to, for, you know, to see if it, there, there was any criminality. Yeah, Alex, thank you so much. Of course, the Prime Minister speaking to lawmakers today, something that a lot of people will be watching, including us. Alex Morales there from our UK government team. Now, smart conversations continue on Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. This hour, we speak about the unrest in Kazakhstan, the special representative of the country's president. Up next, we also discuss commodities with BlackRock's Evi Hambro. You can send in your questions on IB Plus TV Go. This is Bloomberg. Jay Powell vows to keep inflation in check with key CPI data out today. Consensus says the December print may hit 7%. Boris Johnson under pressure over Partygate this afternoon. MPs will question the Prime Minister over lockdown, breaking gathering allegations. And stay with Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Shortly, we'll be speaking to the special representative of the President of Kazakhstan for international cooperations. You can send in your questions on IB plus TV Go. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, this is what the markets are telling us. First of all, there is a bit of a buying on the CPI figures that will come out later today. Uh, this is on the back of what the Fed was telling us, that actually the chair, Fed, you know, Jay Powell was saying, look, inflation will run up, but he has the tools to deal with that, whilst at the same time not hurting the U.S. economy. So fears that the expansion will be jeopardized by tighter policy to curb price pressures appear to have been allayed for now. After after these soothing words and uh, we are expecting U.S. consumer price index that print to have quickened in December to 7.1 percent the highest in four decades. Now the Fed chair Jay Powell also again once again vowing to act if needed to contain inflation and help ensure full employment. Speaking before the Senate Banking Committee on Tuesday for his confirmation hearing Powell assured Congress that 2022 will be a year of normalization for Fed policy. We and essentially all other mainstream forecasters forecasted that, that by now we'd be seeing much lower inflation. And that, that's, that's not what happened. The economy no longer needs or wants the very highly accommodative policies that we've had in place to deal with the pandemic and the aftermath. We'll be normalizing policy, meaning we're going to end our asset purchases in March, meaning we'll be raising rates over the course of the year. If we have to raise interest rates more over time, we will. At some point, perhaps later this year, we will start to allow the balance sheet to run off. It is really time for us to begin to move away from those emergency pandemic settings to a more normal level. But it's a long road to normal from where we are. Now, during periods of rising inflation, commodities have typically performed well. Now, with the focus on the green energy transition, could the commodity market sustain its attractiveness? Well, we're joined by Evie Hambro, who's Global Head of Thematic and Sector Investing at BlackRock. Evie, as always, thank you so much for making us smarter and giving us insights on what kind of commodities will outperform. What does 2022 look like? Well, I was watching your show the other day, Francie, and listening to Jeff Curry, and um, it was an incredibly uh, bullish uh, segment. And I have to say, it's, it's hard to disagree with a, a lot of the thinking. Uh, we've got some really exciting dynamics uh, in the commodity markets at play, and, and you've covered this uh, uh, many times in the past. But you know, when we, when we kind of uh, look at the, the outlook from here, you know, we've had many years of underinvestment into new resource production uh, by commodity producers. We've had a whole series of, uh, I guess, ESG-related pressures, which have also constrained uh, that investment as well, especially in the yep. in the fossil fuel area and, and oil in particular. So the outlook for the commodities on the supply side is tight. Uh, markets, because of the, the pandemic and, and a big recovery in demand we've had last year, inventories are low. Uh, and the, and the medium-term outlook for demand is incredibly strong. Um, so you know, prices today are, are healthy levels.
Um, but I think if we see any form of disruption, uh, and you know, when we go into periods like this, we always see disruption, whether it's strikes or, or issues at producing assets, you know, prices could go um, you know, very, very high indeed. But so, Evie, do you also expect actually the super cycle to you know, potentially last a decade? And what does it mean for asset dislocation? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, we've certainly got decades worth of high rates of investment into infrastructure as the world seeks to decarbonize. Uh, and I think that that's a widely held consensual view. Uh, clearly, you know, mm -hmm. things don't go up in a straight line. They never do. Uh, and if they do go up in a straight line, they tend to come down in a straight line. Um, so I think what, what we're likely to see is strong demand that will keep prices at very, very good levels for the producers for many um, years into the future, and that could be decades. Uh, and I think it'll take a it, 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 what we're seeing also is even if we did see a kind of a return to the to, to the days where companies were a little bit reckless with their balance sheet and started to kind of wildly invest into new capacity, it's taking so long to bring new assets into production uh, these days. You know, the permitting process, the ESG constraints, you know, everything is taking longer to, yeah. to bring a, a new producing asset uh, to the market. And as a result, it's, you know, that, that kind of lag, that price elasticity of supply is going to play into the hands of the people who've got existing production. So what's your high conviction? Do you go on to you know, oil or is it maybe some of the materials? If we go into this transition and even if the ESG transition on climate change gets accelerated, there are a lot of rare earths that will need to make the technologies of tomorrow. Yeah, absolutely. We're going into an environment today and we're already actually in it where we're seeing uh, new uses um, being uh, found for commodities that haven't had the kind of exciting you know, front page media coverage uh, in the past. You know, you look at the, what's happened in the lithium market where, you know, I, I think we were very early, we came onto your show speaking about this a few years ago. Um, and, you know, the exciting dynamics there as the world's moving to increased use of batteries and, and lithium's role within that. This was a, a, a relatively boring commodity that people didn't have much focus on and now is front page news. Uh, and we're seeing that play out in a variety of other commodities. But I think one thing is for certain is that the chemistry that we have today in many of these applications is going to change. And that's going to result in different dynamics yep. of supply and demand uh, for those individual commodities. You know, we're going to see new uses for certain commodities coming in that will make these uh, products much more efficient, lower cost, uh, and more productive uh, as we seek to go through this transition. So has, you know, has the pandemic sped up the, the green transition, Evian? What does that mean for copper? Could we see a day not too far in the distance where copper is more important for the world than oil? Now, that, that really is a big question. Uh, I think that's an unlikely situation, um, but there is no getting around the fact that you cannot uh, do the transition without copper. Uh, and the copper markets have been kind of waiting for this day for many years. You know, we've spoken about it in the, in the past. You know, we're seeing huge amounts of demand growth for copper. The, we're seeing rising mm -hmm. uh, intensity of copper use per unit of GDP. We're seeing rising intensity of copper use per capita. Uh, around the world as well uh, and, and with with that need needs more supply now that supply can come from higher rates of recycling and above better use of above ground infrastructure but it needs net new production um, from the resources industry uh, and what we're seeing today is yeah. it, we're just not seeing that growth in supply in actual fact we're seeing rising challenges to bring that supply into the future whether it's falling grades more remote locations riskier countries um, access to water, access to people, you know, all of these things are making it more difficult to bring new production online. Uh, and I, so I think there will be a big delay. And, and during a period where there is a gap between supply and demand and large deficits and low inventories, any disruption is going to play out in some fairly explosive price moves. So, Evie, what does that mean for some of the companies that you like? And is the biggest risk actually that there's an activist shareholder that will change the trajectory to become more climate change? I mean, the biggest risk, not for the world, but actually for, you know, an investor in that company. Yeah, I think one, one everybody's very focused with regards to the transition on the technology companies or the companies that are driving the most visible elements of the change, whether it's the electric vehicles uh, and so on. What everyone's forgetting is that all of these businesses need raw materials. You know, you cannot do the transition without raw materials. So it is, it is very surprising to us 
that we see such incredible value in these companies. You know, very, very strong balance sheets, well-run businesses today, very different in strategy from the businesses of the, of the China-related uh, cycle at the beginning of this century. Uh, we're seeing very high margins and, and profitability, brilliant dividends coming back to shareholders, and very, very low multiples. It seems as though this core element of the transition has been completely ignored um, by many investors. And, and so we're, we're thrilled by this because we can own these businesses and, and deliver huge amounts of value to our clients. But at some point, people will realize uh, how essential these businesses are for the transition and capital will flow into them. And that should change the, change the valuations. All right, Evie, thank you so much. Evie Hambro there, uh, sometimes a tough sell because of the focus on climate change. Global head of thematic and sector investing at BlackRock joining us this morning. Now, coming up, NATO and Russia are set to hold crunch talks today. That's as concerns over a possible Ukraine invasion persist. Plus, we'll also have our conversation with a special representative for the president of Kazakhstan for international cooperation. That's an exclusive. It's up next, and this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, NATO and Russian officials are set to hold crunch talks in Brussels today with Ukraine top of the agenda. Both sides have set expectations low as Moscow continues its aggressive buildup of troops on the country's border. Well, joining us now outside NATO's headquarters in Brussels is Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo. So, Maria, can NATO actually go beyond what U.S. and Russia talks produced earlier this week? Well, Francine, that is what they're hoping. But, you know, a diplomatic path over uh, this very tense situation is very hard to find. If you take what everyone said at their word, it's, it's very difficult to find that compromise. The Russians say that they want a very crystal clear black and white guarantee that Ukraine will not join uh, NATO. That list potentially could be expanded. And, of course, for NATO, this is a non-starter. This is an open-door organization. That's something that the Secretary General repeated this morning. Now, Francine, the meeting we know is underway. We're expecting it, that it will last for about uh, three hours, and then we'll hear from each participant. What is interesting, however, is that when you look at the currency market, you do see that the Russian ruble is weakening today. Potentially, you know, this idea that we don't get anything that pushes through a breakthrough. Again, as I said, the diplomatic path here still remains very, very cloudy. Thank you so much, Armaria Tadeo, there at NATO headquarters in Brussels. Now, also across the border from Russia, the situation in Kazakhstan is now stable. That's according to President Tokayev. He told lawmakers that Russian-led troops would begin to leave the country in two days. He also denounced oligarch groups that dominate Kazakhstan's economy, saying officials failed to respond to what he called a terrorist threat from inside and outside of the country. Well, now joined by Yerzan Kazian. He is special representative for the president of Kazakhstan for international cooperation. Thank you so much for joining us today. Could Kazakhstan now fall too closely aligned with Russia and how difficult will that be to rebuild ties with the UK, Europe and the US? Well, thank you, Francine, for having me. And uh, I would like uh, to start by saying that thanks God situation in Kazakhstan has been stabilized. Uh, last week we experienced uh, an unprecedented violence across the country. What uh, started uh, with the peaceful protest, uh, which is normal standard uh, in Kazakhstan, uh, with the, uh, given the spike of the uh, prices for gas, which were addressed and controlled. Uh, regretfully, the uh, this peaceful protest in different parts of the country has been hijacked by perpetrators and uh, domestic terrorists and and foreign terrorists, and they were engaged in sleeper cells and. Uh, Kazakhstan, Kazian, you know, has been. Uh, we we were stable, promised to understand. Yeah. yeah, we were promised to, to be given evidence of where these alleged perpetrators came from. Can you point fingers? Who is behind what you think was an unpeaceful protest? Terrorists from the outside, I think, is how your president called them. Well, yes, uh, this is the uh, very uh, important question, and the special government commission has been established to. Uh, verify the root causes of the problem. Uh, regretfully, it was unexpected, and as I said, uh, uh, it seems to be well organized because, given the magnitude and scale of uh, destruction, attacks, uh, the military tactics that has been used, uh, 
of course, all these uh, questions has to be answered, and uh, Kazakhstan has nothing to hide. We will we will certainly reveal evidences in due course. And uh, right. you know, Kazakhstan always been uh, uh, a very stable and peaceful country, having excellent relations both with the West and with the East. So at the moment, there are also rumors about rival clans being cause, you know, the cause of much violence. Um, your president says it was actually a coup attempt. By whom? Can, can you give us an indication of what you think happened? Well, I would not rush into the uh, premature conclusions uh, of what happened in the country. For sure, it was an unprecedented attack on the constitutional order, an assault on the statehood of Kazakhstan, an attempt of create a controlled chaos in the country, and uh, and of course even the seizure of the power. And uh, uh, this all has been prevented. And uh, as I said, we live in a in a huge region, and Kazakhstan being the large, ninth largest territory in the world with a huge economy, biggest economy in the region, and uh, the st stability uh, in Kazakhstan is remains to be very important. We. We'll reveal all the right. uh, details as soon as the investigation committee will, will produce uh, its first result. Kazakhstan had also said you will increase taxes for mining companies. How much will the tax burden be? Well, the uh, president made a very clear uh, statement yesterday in the parliament. Uh, now we have to restore the confidence of the investors. We have to uh, bridge the gap, uh, uh, economic inequality. We are between the uh, in the citizens and also between the regions of the country, and uh, speaking about the, uh, the search of the price of the industrial metals, uh, uh, it, this is was the reasons why the president uh, specified the greater tax revenue from uh, uh, national mining sector. But of course, all these issues will be discussed uh, in a close consultations with the stakeholders. You know that Kazakhstan has a great number of foreign companies that are operating for more than 30 years, and uh, uh, yeah. we have uh, excellent experience of dealing with uh, both but, domestic and foreign ex investors, and we want them to remain confident uh, and trust, uh, having trust in the government. And by the way, the government has been reshuffled. The new prime right. minister Sir. assumed its post. I, I want to ask you a little bit more about some of the tax load. So, for example, for Kazatomprom, and I know the president was talking about, you know, linked to commodity prices, but do you have an idea of how much tax Kazatomprom will actually pay and whether there will also be additional taxes for banks? Well, all these things has been uh, announced uh, yesterday in his speech. Uh, we need some time to uh, digest and... Uh, 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 and engage into the more meaningful discussion, as I said, with the stakeholders. And uh, yes, you're right. The re uranium price has uh, uh, has been spiked, and uh, uh, Kazakhstan, uh, being the biggest uranium producing country in the world, we understand that, yeah. we see that, and uh, again, again, we want to uh, uh, restore the confidence of the investors in our economy. I mean, of course, Kazakhstan is a key supplier of natural resources to the world. You mentioned oil. There's also zinc. There's also uranium. Have these flows actually been impacted significantly because of what's happened, or has it now been restored? What is important to say that uh, even with that unprecedented attack, that or as, I, as we call it, an act of aggression, that uh, simultaneously has, temp has been taking place in 11 regions of our country, there were no interruption of the gas and oil uh, production and supply to the world markets, similarly to other uh, commodities uh, that Kazakhstan is famous for. And uh, that gives, uh, shows the level of resilience of my country. And uh, uh, I tell you more that uh, all the uh, 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 business, uh, mo most of the uh, electricity supply, heating, everything was working uh, perfectly well. And that, that, that is, a vivid example that even in this difficult situation, the authorities uh, uh, managed to maintain and stabilize the situation as quick as possible. Right. And, and so, sir, I, I think one of the questions that markets want to know, can you assure Kazakhstan's customers that will, they will continue to get this uninterrupted flow of the resources that they actually need? Absolutely. Absolutely. I have no doubt about that.
Uh, as I said, <coughs> we've been reliable suppliers of hy uh, hydrocarbons and other materials to the market. European Union remains to be our biggest trading partner, and we will continue to uh, uh, strengthen our cooperation, trade and economic cooperation with our uh, natural partners. <coughs> Thank you. All right, thank you so much for joining us. Erzan Kazian there is a special representative of the president of Kazakhstan for international cooperation. Now, up next, we'll talk a lot more about the CPI figures from the U.S. We'll also get more insight into the trading scandal that's seen the resignation of a number of Fed officials. That's coming up next, and this is Bloomberg. I do not believe we have an ethics problem. I think what happened was there was illumination on things that uh, gave an appearance issue, right? They were technically correct in terms of the rules, but it was the appearance issue. Um, the chair and the Fed are taking actions to strengthen the rules upon which we have to abide. And I think that is addressing the situation. Well, that was the Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester on the latest ethics issues facing the central bank following the recent revelations about Vice Chair Richard Clarida's trading activities. Now, you may recall that he has decided to step down two weeks earlier than scheduled. Joining me now for more is our Bloomberg DC morning editor, Kathleen Hunter. Kathleen, what I don't understand is why don't they just change the rules? Things can be legal but feel wrong. So why isn't this scandal also cutting through more in DC? Well, I think that's that's part of the issue is that, you know, it's it's whether it's uh, passes the smell test in addition to being technically uh, legal or illegal. And I think that's where the, the, the rub is here. And so I think, though, as you say, it's not cutting through more in D.C. because I think there are big fears among the U.S. public about inflation right now. There are huge fears about the coronavirus pandemic. I think those are really overshadowing some of these questions about ethics at the Fed. Uh, you know, that being said, I also think that Clarida's decision to step down and announce that decision, you know, uh, the day before Powell was going to go in front of the Senate Banking Committee, took a little bit of the wind out of the sails of Elizabeth Warren and some of the others who might have wanted to make more of an issue of this. Also, it's important to remember that Powell is someone that is well liked by Republicans. Um, and so therefore, you know, there's not a lot of ire may be coming his way from the Republican side as much as there might have been otherwise, um, you know, if he had been a different, if Biden had chosen a different nominee. And I think also, yeah. finally, Powell really did represent himself with UL yesterday in saying that they are making some different, some changes to the ethics rules. And so I think there's a sense that Congress might wait and see what those are um, before acting further. Um, Kathleen, in 30 seconds, what impact could it actually have on the makeup of the Fed? Well, I think Joe Biden has three seats that he needs to fill, and certainly there's going to be even more scrutiny of any kind of ethical, um, you know, any any kind of, there's going to be even more ethical scrutiny of those nominees when they do come forward, a look at them very closely at their trading practices, and certainly they're not going to be able to escape that kind of scrutiny from Congress. Kathleen, thank you so much. Uh, Kathleen Hunter there from our U.S. politics team. Now, Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour. Matt Miller in New York with Kayla Lyons and Anne Edwards here in London. Happy Wednesday, CPI U.S. Day. This is Bloomberg. are on the Federal Reserve right now and are the views on how many times the Fed needs to hike this year and into next year. There's still a lot of uncertainty around the outlook. There's uncertainty about how the pandemic plays out. If we have to raise interest rates more over time, we will. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, and 6 p.m. in Hong Kong. On this Wednesday, January 12th, our sto uh, top stories today. Risky business. Jerome Powell tries to convince lawmakers that the Fed can bring down inflation without hurting the U.S. economy. We'll get fresh inflation data at 8.30 New York time. Markets appear to be reassured by Powell, but what happens if global policymakers get the post-pandemic recovery wrong?
In the UK, Conservative politicians have no reason to party. They're concerned that the Partygate scandal could lead to Boris Johnson's downfall. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kayleigh Lyons in New York. We put some of the politics to one side for a moment, Kayleigh. We focus on the data. Inflation, inflation, inflation. Will it get to seven? A key question. Economists expect that it will when we get that read in about three and a half hours' time, Anna. It really is going to be all about CPI today. That said, it was a pretty positive session in Asia overnight before we got that data. The MSCI Asia Pacific Index was up about 1.6%. All of the major benchmarks from Japan to China to Hong Kong were up at least 1%. Actually, in Hong Kong, nearly three full percentage points. And that was a move led by technology. The Hang Seng Tech Index up about 5% as we see some dip buying coming into the likes of JD.com and Alibaba. Investors really trying to take advantage of how cheap those stocks are right now. You also saw the tech-heavy Chinex Index in China up about 2.6%. And, of course, that follows the inflation data we got out of China overnight. 10.3% producer price inflation for the month of December. That was a moderation from November. You also saw consumer prices uh, moderating as well. So that really reinforces the idea that policy can become easier in China and that the PBOC can actually cut rates while we're talking about hiking them in other parts of the world. And then finally, I would note, given the risk on tone, we saw no real appetite for the safe haven Japanese yen. Uh, Matt, it is weaker against the dollar by about... Uh, Call it a tenth of a percent. Right now, we're trading at 115.36. Very interesting to look at the end, especially a longer-term view. I mean, the dollar has just weakened and weakened and weakened um, from its highs in November. And if you look at a, a big view, it's come down really since March of 2020. So not a lot of concern out there. S&P futures are up only one-tenth of one percent, but after a gain of almost one percent yesterday, the 10-year yield continues to rise uh, right now back to 174.28. And the dollar, as I said, continues to fall. So it's really interesting to watch yields go up and the dollar come down. Crude also uh, up right now, $81.38 a barrel. And this is not Brent. This is NYMEX, WTI crude. We're going to talk to Eric Cantor, former majority leader uh, in um, Riyadh today. He is now working with Ken Mollis and co. And then Bitcoin back on the rise, a little bit up to $42,815. But as we've seen, Bitcoin really moves with stocks with risk assets. Assets. Um, and so it doesn't look like there's a lot mm. driving it in terms of the fundamentals. Anna? Yeah, Bitcoin moving with stocks. Stocks in Europe are up. Bitcoin is up. This is the picture across European equity markets then, Matt. We have stocks moving to the upside. Powell saying just enough to reassure investors, to reassure them perhaps that they can maybe navigate that landing for the U.S. economy uh, and fight inflation. Having a look at what's uh, driving this, then we've got basic resources, the best performing sector on the stock 600 this morning, up by 2.8%. Matt was talking there about oil prices, other commodity prices also moving to the upside. Uh, we will be live in Riyadh later to talk more about the mining sector. So worth keeping an eye on that sector this morning. I put in euro dollar, not because it's moving, because it isn't, uh, because industrial production numbers just hitting from the eurozone. And they're a pretty mixed bag. We're just giving you the details at the bottom of the screen. Pretty mixed versus estimates is basically what you need to know. And the euro doesn't move. This is a really interesting story. Philips, medical equipment manufacturer. There are chips in medical equipment these days, of course. They were not able to deliver some of that medical equipment in the last quarter to customers because of a shortage in ch of chips. They thought the last quarter was going to see a recovery on that front. They didn't see that recovery. Things worsened in the fourth quarter. So if you take any message away from the European corporate reporting season so far, perhaps it is that one. And that makes us a little bit wary of what we see ahead. It's a different view over at TeamViewer. This is a software company over in Germany. That stock flies higher, up by 13, 14% on the back of an upgrade to guidance. But it's that Philips story that I think is really worth considering as we move into the early earning season ahead, Ben Kayleigh. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, the U.S. earnings season going to kick off in earnest at the end of this week when the big banks start reporting. Of course, that's coming on Friday. As for what is ahead today, Wednesday, as Anna mentioned, that Saudi Minerals Conference is taking place. The summit is the first event focused on developing the mining industry in the country. Speakers include the Saudi oil minister, the CEO of Barrett Gold. And as Matt mentioned, we will have Eric Can Cantor of Molis joining us from that conference later on this hour. Then later on today, UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson will face some questions in Parliament about whether he attended a Downing Street party in May 2020 when such social gatherings were forbidden. That drinks party, as they're calling it, getting a lot of attention over the last 24 drinks hours party. or so. 
And then, of course, the U.S. and its NATO allies are meeting with Russia in Brussels. There will be a press conference by the NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg and U.S. Deputy Secretary of State Wendy Sherman later on today. And then finally, we already mentioned this, but the big event, U.S. CPI data at 8.30 a.m. New York time. It's expected to show prices rose 7 percent in December. That is the most since 1982, Matt. Wow, 1982. All right, Fed Chair Jerome Powell says the central bank won't hesitate to act if needed to contain inflation and help ensure full employment. Aren't those things at odds with each other? He spoke at his confirmation hearing at the Senate Banking Committee yesterday. If we see inflation persisting at high levels longer than expected, then then we will, you know, then we'll if we have to raise interest rates more over time, we will. We will use our tools to get inflation back. Michael McKee, Bloomberg International Economics and Policy Correspondent, joins us now. And so Powell says he's going to act. He won't hesitate to contain inflation and to ensure full employment. Don't they have to pull on different levers for those issues? Well, not really in this case, because there isn't much they can do about the inflation side, at least according to Powell, who says that the Fed is doing its best to contain inflation. But a lot of this is supply chain issues. And you look at what happened. You were talking earlier, Matt, about oil prices going up again. That's what people are looking at. Now, 7 percent, we love round numbers. But the number that people are really going to care about is farther down in the report, and that is the difference between where inflation is and where earnings are. And right now, people are losing ground on earnings to their to the inflation rate. You can see here mm. how uh, we are falling behind. Inflation higher than what you're getting even with the ex additional money that people are paying these days to get people to go back to work. Well, and at the end of the day, what the data means is really important for the markets because there's a read through into how that's going to affect Fed policy. You were speaking with Loretta Mester yesterday. We also heard from Rafael Bostic, both Fed presidents of different regional feds. There seems to be a growing chorus for a hike in March. Is the bias now more towards them lifting off in March than them not lifting off in March? It appears that way. You've already got not just Loretta Mester, but Esther George and Jim Bullard, who are also voting members of the Open Market Committee this year, who have endorsed the idea of a March move. And when Jay Powell said we're going to raise rates, he didn't put a time frame on it, but he certainly didn't come out against the idea of doing something in March. So it looks like at this point, unless there's some big change, and we'll find out at 8.30 this morning, uh, New York time, uh, there's going to be a move in March because 7% uh, isn't that much much different from the 6.8 we have now, but as I said, we love round numbers. Yeah, and Bloomberg Intelligence thinks we're going to hit 7.2 percent for the January figure, so that looks like it could be on the way up. Michael McKee, thank you very much for that. Let's get down to Washington, D.C. Pat Toomey, the top Republican on the Senate Banking Committee, has told Bloomberg he has serious concerns about the possible nomination of former Fed Governor Sarah Bloom Raskin as vice chair of supervision at the Fed. Anne-Marie Hordern joins us now out of Washington, D.C. So, Anne-Marie, what's the story with Toomey and Raskin? Really a red flag coming from this senior Republican on the banking committee. He is saying that he has these concerns given her stance on climate change. In a statement to Bloomberg, he said uh, if she is nominated, she would abuse the Fed's narrow statutory mandates on monetary policy to have the central bank actively engage in capital allocation. Such actions not only threaten both the Fed's independence and effectiveness, but would also weaken economic growth. So he said that she had put pressure on the banks or written about the choke off credit to traditional energy companies and exclude these employers from many Fed emergency lending facilities. Now, what Mike was talking about was, of course, what we heard about Chair Powell yesterday. And he was asked about climate change. And he said there is a place to talk about climate change at the Fed, but it's a very narrow mandate. But what this comes down to is a potential headache for the Biden administration. She is the top pick for this position on vice chair of supervision at the moment. We still don't know what their three nominations are for certain because they have yet to announce them. But if you get a number of Republicans coming out against Sarah Bloom Raskin, the administration needs to make sure they have all Democrats lined up for her. And that could potentially be hard from some Democrats from very heavy energy states. I'm thinking of Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia. So we continue to await those picks for the remaining seats from President Biden and Marie. Meanwhile, the president speaking out about other issues and calling on the U.S. Senate to change its rules to allow a simple majority to pass voting rights legislation. He said in Atlanta that GOP backed state laws threaten democracy. Take a listen. I believe the threat to our democracy is so grave that we must find a way to pass these voting rights bills. Debate them. Vote. 
let the majority prevail. And if that bare minimum is blocked, we have no option but to change the Senate rules, including getting rid of the filibuster for this. So, Anne Marie, is this really about voting rights or is this about getting rid of the filibuster? Well, if you listen to him carefully, he says if the bare minimum does not work, we need to get rid of the filibuster for this. So what he is saying is getting rid of the filibuster, not in its entirety, but for voting rights legislation. He gave a, he was very emphatic yesterday about the fact that Congress needs to pass voting rights legislation. The issue right now the administration is facing is actually a bit of lackluster response or even backlash from many in the party who think this is just too little too late. Immediately after that speech in our inboxes, we heard from the head of the NAACP who said that this administration needs more action, less words, and that the president needs to apply the same level of urgency around voting rights the way he did for Build Back Better and infrastructure, and if not, America may soon be unrecognizable. But, of course, we know the issue is that, again, the president needs to get even members of his own party on board in order to amend the filibuster rules. Anne-Marie, thanks very much. Yeah, those civil rights groups then calling for him to uh, do deals, as he's famous for. Anne-Marie Hordan joining us there from Washington. Back over on this side of the Atlantic, NATO and Russian officials are set to hold crunch talks in Brussels today, with Ukraine top of the agenda. Both sides have set expectations low as Moscow continues its aggressive buildup of troops on the country's border. Joining us now from outside NATO's headquarters in Brussels is Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo. Maria, can NATO go beyond what US and Russia talks produce earlier this week, which was basically just a pledge to keep talking. Uh, yes, Anna, and that is really the question. What's the point of holding a meeting like this? But, uh, you know, just to give you some of the logistics before we get into the details, we know that this is uh, a meeting that's probably going to last uh, three hours. We know that it's the first time Russian officials and NATO meet in two years. And a lot of people look at this as a sign that, hey, we're still talking, this is good, and there's still a uh, dialogue. Of course, the criticism here is that today at NATO, we're debating what many would say is a completely manufactured crisis by Vladimir Putin. We would not be here if he hadn't deployed for Forces to the Ukrainian border. Now, again, whether or not we get something on paper today is unclear. We do get the impression that, Anna, in many ways, this is a story that's just going to go on for many weeks before we get anything that looks like a resolution. All right, thank you so much to Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo in Brussels. Now, I want to get away from geopolitics and back to the markets and take a look at some stocks moving in pre-market trading here in the U.S. A big underperformer to the downside, Biogen, down about 9% on news that the U.S. government is uh, only limiting Medicare coverage of its Alzheimer's treatment to those in clinical trials. So that could really limit use of the drug, and as a result, it is dragging on the stock this morning. To the upside, though, Dish Networks, the New York Post reporting overnight that it is once again in talks with DirecTV about a possible merger even though regulators have kind of hampered that effort in the past. That stock is up about 7% before the bell. And one final mover to the upside, really along with most Chinese ADRs, uh, Chinese tech companies listed here in the U.S., DD is moving higher to the tune of nearly 5%. And some separate news on that front, Anna. The South China Morning Post reporting that DD is looking at an IPO in Hong Kong in the second quarter. Interesting stuff, and we certainly saw some strong performance through the Asia session from some Chinese tech names. And now coming up on the program, as we've been saying, we'll be live at the Future Minerals Summit in Riyadh with Eric Cantor, Molis Managing Director and Vice Chairman. We'll also, of course, focus on US CPI. Wells Fargo Senior Economist Sarah House will be with us. What are the details beneath that expected 7% reading that Sarah is really going to be focused on? Plus, calls for resignation. Boris Johnson facing questions in Parliament today over a party when social gatherings were forbidden bidden in May 2020. More ahead, this is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller here in New York with Kaylee Lyons, Anna Edwards over in London. I've got one of those charts today that I think if you're a viewer or a listener, we are, of course, simulcast on Bloomberg Radio and Bloomberg Television, get out a pencil and paper and write this down. If you're driving, pull over first. 5149 is the number that you have to remember in the terminal. So you type G hashtag BTV 5149. This is a brilliant chart because it takes an example of quantitative tightening. In fact, 
the only example that we have from 2019 and shows you what happened then in case you want to prepare your trades for that now. Valerie Sarasuelo put this together for us in London and it shows that we had stock struggling. We had twos, tens flattening. And the interesting thing here is that it looks like the markets are getting ready for the opposite. They're getting ready for really a steepener as we go into what we expect to be quantitative tightening in 2022. Joining us to talk about this is Christine Aquino. She helps lead our market coverage for us out of London. So Christine, can we take any lessons from 2019 and apply them now in 2022 as we get ready for QT? Well, Matt, I think the biggest lesson that we can take is that the situation in 2019 is vastly, vastly different from what we're seeing now. You're absolutely correct in pointing out that the shape of the yield curve as we get ready for the process of Fed tightening isn't quite uh, similar to what we saw in previous years. And of course, you know, you have a bunch of catalysts contributing to that, particularly what we've seen in the aftermath of the pandemic and how economies are recovering from that. And of course, the idea as well that really this vast amount of a central bank accommodative policy that we've seen for a good part of the last decade has done some funky things to the bond markets in general. And perhaps some of those signals and yield curves may not be as reliable as we once thought they were. It's done some funky things, Christine. I like the phrasing. And absolutely, we shouldn't forget the big role that central banks play in these markets uh, these days. Let me ask you about your view on FX and volatility. We talked a lot about bond market volatility last year. I think you've got some thoughts around FX volatility coming back, Christine, which is an interesting day to mention it because the dollar is flat, the euro is flat, the yen is pretty flat, the pound's pretty flat. So where's this vol coming from? Uh, well, Anna, that has been long the bugbear of FX traders the world over. The fact that really currency volatility has just not caught up with what we're seeing in bonds and stocks. But I think this year, what really is going to drive that based on our conversations with various investors and strategists is the, the potential divergence in the pace of policy tightening that we could expect between the Fed, the European Central Bank, the Bank of England. They're all heading toward that tightening uh, stance, of course, but at very, very different paces. And of course, we bring in China as well, which is moving in the opposite mm. direction and moving toward easing. Mm. And you really could see that coming alive in FX markets this year. You've got Morgan Stanley strategists, you've got City strategists, you've got M&G investments all saying, hey, now might be the time to get long EMFX because the dollar may have topped ahead of a tightening cycle. What do you think about that? That's really very interesting, Matt, because, yeah, EMFX and emerging markets in general had really been battered toward the last few months of 2021. It seemed like it was kind of a perfect storm for them. The prospect of Fed tightening, just as we were getting some dour headlines related to Omicron, very different story at the start of this year, of course. And I think what we're seeing here is a bit of a Goldilocks situation for emerging markets in that a lot of that Fed expectation is quite priced in at the moment. Yeah. And so limited gains for the dollar, which is to the benefit of EM. Well, a lot of the Fed expectations have also been priced in here in the U.S. And given that, Christine, can CPI really be a catalyst today or will it just confirm what the market has already traded? I think that's exactly it, Kaylee. It will either add to the narrative that, in fact, it is a go for the Fed when it comes to rate hikes and when it comes to that balance sheet runoff, or if we see a little bit of a softer print, could throw a little bit of doubt over um, the, the various mechanisms that the Fed has and how quickly or what it can use in terms of its options. But it certainly won't derail the fact that uh, Fed tightening is coming and mm. is coming soon. Okay, Christine, thanks very much. Bloomberg's Christine Aquino joining us here live on sets in London. And for more market analysis, check out MLIV Go on the terminal. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines with Matt Miller in New York and Anna Edwards in London. Now let's get the first word news and an Omicron outbreak in China is sending jitters through global supply chains. Manufacturers and shippers are bracing for more problems inside the world's biggest trading nation. Two Chinese cities are now locked down and more are facing disruption. Policymakers will have to decide how much to increase restrictions.
In the UK, the rapid spread of the Omicron variant led to a spike in the number of people missing work last week. According to an analysis for Bloomberg News, employee absences rose 18% compared to the same period in 2021. In all, it's estimated that 3.1 million Britons were affected last week. Meanwhile, in the UK, the so-called Partygate scandal has concerned members of Prime Minister Boris Johnson's Conservative Party. They're worried about whether he can survive allegations of pandemic rule-breaking parties at his office. Two new polls out today show that a majority of voters think Johnson should resign. And in Australia, tennis star Novak Djokovic has broken his silence. He admitted he attended a newspaper interview and photo shoot last month when he knew he was infected with the coronavirus. And he blamed human error for an incorrect travel declaration. Earlier this week, an Australian court quashed the cancellation of his visa, allowing him to play in the Australian Open. It'll be interesting to see how this all shakes out, Anna. Absolutely. Will he take to the court and what kind of response will he find in Melbourne if he does? Coming up next, we'll get back to the markets. We'll talk about commodities. Eric Cantor, Molis Managing Director and Vice Chairman, joins us. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines in New York. Here's what you need to know. The U.S. Consumer Price Index coming out today is expected to show that inflation climbed to 7% in the month of December. That would be the most since 1982. Uh, that will keep markets' attention on a possible Fed rate liftoff as soon as the March policymakers meeting. Billionaire bond fund manager Jeffrey Gundlach warns that recessionary pressure is building along with inflation. In a webcast, Gundlach said the Fed seems pretty far behind the curve when wage growth is considered. And Citigroup plans to get out of the retail banking business in Mexico. Mexican billionaire Ricardo Salinas says he's interested in buying their business. Meanwhile, Morgan Stanley reportedly plans to double the number of bankers it has in Paris to 300 by the end of next year. That's a look at what you need to know this morning. Matt, what do we need to know about how markets are positioned? Well, there's a lot going on today, Anna, so I struggle to fit it into a short amount of time. But in terms of futures, we're up again after a gain yesterday. In terms of the 10-year yield, it's rising again. The dollar is down again. This is what I think is most interesting. NYMEX crude, $81.44. <laughs> Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Barclays, BNP Paribas, Bernstein, <laughs> City, all overweight energy right now because the producers are trading at a 40% discount to the stock 600 and their earnings are beating the stock 600 if you look forward. So really fascinating stuff there. Bitcoin, meanwhile, up half a percent, um, 42,906. Interesting that Bitcoin isn't very interesting, right? The volatility just isn't there right now. We've been hovering around this $40,000 mark. It seems like for weeks, Kaylee. Yeah, and now, of course, because you were so excited about oil, I feel like I need to take a look at energy in pre-market trading. It is actually, when you look at the select sector, spider higher on the day. But there's some other individual movers I did want to note. A big underperformer moving to the downside by more than 9% is Biogen. The U.S. government is limiting Medicare coverage of its Alzheimer's drug to just those in clinical trials. So really putting restrictions on how much that drug can be used. A lot of stocks moving to the upside, though, including ADRs of Chinese technology companies, one of them being Alibaba, up the better part of three percentage points in the early hours trade here in the U.S. after big gains in the Asian session overnight. Then I also wanted to talk about a few financial stocks uh, moving higher. Ally Financial is up about 2.9 percent after announcing a $2 billion dividend. And then, Anna, you mentioned this at the top. Citigroup is exiting its consumer banking operations in Mexico. And, of course, we're awaiting Citigroup's results, as well as Wells Fargo and J.P. Morgan coming up on Friday, kicking off this earnings season. That stock is up about eight-tenths of a percent before the bell. Yeah, Kaylee, a lot of focus on the banking sector later on this week as we get ready for that earnings story and the higher yield uh, playing into that. What we've got here in Europe, European equity markets move higher. Only four sectors in negative territory. The best performer is basic resources, up by 2.4%. Uh, we've seen strength coming through from commodities since the start of the year. The euro pretty flat. Worth saying we're pretty flat on FX markets as we head towards that really important CPI number coming up a little bit later on today. I put in Philips as well, and this is really interesting. This is a medical equipment maker. This might have a bearing on 
on how we assess supply chains in the earnings season ahead because Philips saying today they were unable to deliver some medical equipment mm. uh, because of a shortage in chips last quarter. So if you thought we were through the worst, that wasn't the case for Philips. They had anticipated things would get better last quarter and they did not, which I think is really interesting on the chip shortages side of things. But to end on a positive team viewer over in Germany, that one trades higher <laughs> on the back of better guidance from the company. That is a software uh, business, Matt. A software business. I don't even think the people at TeamViewer know exactly what their software does. It's it's really <laughs> well, the confounding. Stock's up 14%, so somebody does. Let me tell you, on the chips front, Volkswagen says it's going to get worse still. And we had some amazing shifts in the U.S. car industry, in the global car industry, because of the chip shortage. BMW overtook Audi, or sorry, Mercedes, as um, the mm. biggest luxury car maker in the world because they were better at managing their supply chain. And Toyota outsold General Motors in the U.S. for the first time since yeah. 1931. Unbelievable because of that is unbelievable. The chip and the a lot of big questions about supply chains and where it goes if China is in the grips of a new Omicron wave. Are we really through the worst of the chip shortage, or does that get worse again in 2020? Absolutely. I mean, it's a huge fo focus. Speaking of that, the pandemic, um, COVID, maybe won't be public enemy number one for the global economy in 2022. The biggest dangers this year will stem from inflation. They really come from that chip shortage, and the risk that policymakers will make the wrong call in the post-COVID recovery. That's according to today's Big Take. Joining us now for her take on the inflation threat is Sarah House. She's a Wells Fargo senior economist. And Sarah, I understand the Big Take call, but really COVID is behind this, right? Um, it's behind the supply chain issues. It's behind the inflation. And it's what put the Fed in place to possibly make, um, if it hasn't already, a policy mistake. So COVID is still very much behind the inflation pressures that we're seeing. So I think we will see renewed pressure on supply chains, but also, of course, on the labor market as we've seen staffing shortages. And so I think we, we really are still seeing a lot of pressures and ultimately stemming from from COVID. I think you can, when you look at the inflation numbers and the, and the shelter cost outlook, a lot of that is still rooted in the initial response to, to housing preferences. But as we as we look further out, I think you are going to see more of those pressures coming from the labor side of things as we are looking at a persistently tighter labor market. Yeah, and we heard a lot more about that recently. Uh, Jamie Dimon says he hasn't seen this kind of wage pressure in his lifetime. In terms of people calling in sick, we were just talking about 3.1 million people in the UK called in sick with COVID last week. We had an estimate that 5 million Americans called in sick. The WHO now says that half of Europe's population, or more than half, the majority of Europe, is going to get infected within the next few weeks. And Bloomberg Economics has a GDP, a daily GDP tracker that shows a 16% drop in uh, activity in the first week of 2022. Are we going to see a sharp rebound from this, Sarah? I mean, we have in the past, after these huge drops, um, seen a big rebound uh, following. So in activity, I think you there's certainly the, the prospect of a sharper rebound. But I think as, as we think about inflation, so the effects can be long lasting. So, you know, any hit to supply that we see in, in just a short time span of January, that's going to take months to, to catch up from. And so I think that initial activity hit may be short, but we're going to see the, the ripple effects ongoing throughout probably, you know, the first half of the year for, for sure and potentially even longer. Sarah, let's look ahead to the inflation data that's uh, due out uh, from the United States a little bit later on. And, 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 and you know, if we keep things sim simple, we look for whether the number gets to seven. But I know it's more complicated and there's a lot under the surface that is going to be interesting. The inflation number compared to wages we were hearing from our colleague Mike McKee mm -hmm. earlier on. Other things that could be interesting, though, the month on month number actually seen dropping this time around. One, one guest I spoke to earlier said that could add some comfort to markets and the way that they respond to this data. What will you be looking for specifically? Others focus very much on the core number. What's your focus? So I'll be looking at the overall composition of what's driving the increases. So we're looking for a moderation on the headline number to just half a percent gain, but also a half a percent gain in the core index, which would be consistent with what we saw last month. And I think you know, when you step back and you look at, OK, perhaps we'll see some directional improvement on the headline. We're still looking at really lofty gains in, in terms of a monthly basis. And so that means it's still going to be very hard to bring inflation down if we're still seeing prices rise roughly half a percent a, a month each year. And 
And so I think also, um, again, going back to the composition, so that's going to uh, that's gonna shed light on how difficult it might be to rein in some of these inflation pressures as well. Well, and of course, that's a difficulty that the Fed is facing, Sarah. And we heard from the chairman yesterday talking about how the Fed will act to rein in inflation. Does that mean that a move in March is now just entirely baked in? So I, I think they, they've been socializing that, to borrow a, a phrase from the chair in his last press conference. So we've seen a number of Fed officials, even more neutral members like the Richmond Fed's President Barkin, um, really really suggest that March is, is certainly on the table. And I think if you're still, still going to get 7% handles on CPI ahead of that March meeting with the February print, which, which we're expecting, I think the optics are going to be pretty tricky for the Fed to just stand pat at the March meeting if, if you still have such lofty inflation numbers. Well, and, and finally, just on the inflation numbers, as it relates to the consumer, prices are just going a lot higher. And while that wage inflation is starting to show up, it's not necessarily keeping up. Do you start to worry about consumption and tolerance for these higher prices? So on an individual basis, we haven't seen inflation keep up with average hourly earnings, but I think you need to step back and look at the fact that we're still adding hundreds of thousand jobs of each month, and so you have a lot more people collecting a paycheck. And so when we look at the aggregate labor income, so the total wages and salaries growth in the economy, that's doing a much better job keeping up with inflation. And so that suggests to us that consumer spending can still remain on a pretty strong path, even as we do see these inflation numbers um, really, really dent individual consumer purchasing power. Sarah, thanks very much. Sarah House, Wells Fargo Senior Economist. Thanks for joining us this morning here on Bloomberg TV with thoughts on what lies ahead on the inflation story in the United States. Coming up next, uh, we will talk about the mining sector. The conference taking place in Saudi Arabia getting a lot of attention beyond oil. What opportunities lie there? This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later today, U.S. Chamber of Commerce CEO Suzanne Clark. That's at 12 p.m. in New York, 5 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines with Matt Miller in New York and Anna Edwards in London. Joining us now is Tom Keen, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance, who will be breaking down the CPI number at 8.30 a.m. Eastern time. Tom, we're looking at potentially a seven handle at yeah, the headline. Yeah, I, what beneath the surface is most interesting to what you? What beneath the surface is, we'll see what the number is. It could be higher, it could be lower, but it's going to be a lot of pontification about the trend and where we go. And what we have to remember, Kaylee, is we've seen such a spike up that it's really hard to find a trend coming off the data at 8.30. Let's go to the chart. This is a really informative chart. It's actually prettier than I thought it would be. This is goods and service inflation, a little bit of confusion here. And the bottom line is goods inflation in yellow has been suppressed since time began at a 1% and 2% level and has spiked way, way up there, which is a huge part of that 7% combined inflation. Service sector inflation is at a much higher level and has barely risen, Kaylee. So there's a real separation here in the vector of goods and services inflation going back to 2019. Tom, uh, it used to be that Jerome Powell was telling us he had to sit tight in terms of uh, tightening fiscal conditions so that we could achieve maximum employment. Now, yesterday, it seemed like he was saying he has the tools to fight inflation i.e. raising rates, in order to achieve maximum employment. Aren't those two things at cross purposes? Really can't do much about the fiscal discussion. That's hugely involving uh, Congress. Now, there is a balance sheet dynamic, and we're going to feature in uh, surveillance today uh, the latest research note from Steve Major of HSBC, which addresses that directly. With that said, the idea of full employment is front and center and it recently has come very much from the fiscal stimulus and less from the monetary. 
Mm, I, again, one of our colleagues talking <coughs> about this being a pivot from the Fed around uh, becoming more benevolent or trying to bring out its benevolent side. Tom, good morning to you. Um, when you look at the drivers of US CPI, you were there talking about goods and services. I was looking at Chinese inflation overnight and the PPI number there, the factory floor inflation, actually dropped a little. Some people yeah. reference that and say that's um, a good indicator. Others say that is really overblown. Your thoughts? I, I'm really glad you bring that up. This is a global phenomenon and there is a bouncing off of inflations, whether Europe or China and such. What I would suggest is yesterday and the day before, we saw a real bout of worry of 7% inflation. And let's remember, Anna, there's a whole school of thought out there led by David Blanchflower of Dartmouth, which says everybody's overwrought. We're going to see the ease back like we saw within the microcosm that is domestic manufacturing in China. Tom, we obviously got the inflation in China. We're awaiting the inflation data here in the U.S. How much of it do you actually think will be a catalyst for the market, or have we already priced all of it in at this point? Well, there's a, there's a million thoughts on that. You know, there's a thought every interview, uh, Kaylee. What I would suggest is it's been a tumultuous first week of the year. I think Lizanne Saunders at Schwab did a great job overnight of framing out what the first 10 days of the year uh, have looked like. Everybody's placed their bets, placed their markers, and again, and I've said this repeatedly, and I think you heard it from the chairman yesterday, you know what, they're data dependent. They're going to watch the data come in, yeah. including what we see at 8.30 this morning. Tom, thanks so much. Tom sure. Keen, a co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance. He'll be talking you through the uh, inflation numbers a little bit later with the surveillance team. Now, later today, we will continue to get, uh, well, we'll move on from preamble to reaction to the CPI numbers. Uh, that will be with Barclays Chief U.S. Economist Michael Gapen. That is at 8.30 a.m. in New York, 1.30 p.m. London time. This is Bloomberg. But when inflation arrives, it's difficult to stop. It needs to be dealt with in a robust fashion, and I don't think there's political will around the world to do that. That was the CEO of Barrick Gold, Mark Bristow, speaking uh, from the sidelines of the Future Minerals Forum in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. This is the country's first major mining conference. Saudi Arabia is trying to exploit deposits of copper, gold, and other minerals it thinks are worth $1.3 trillion in total. The kingdom sees mining as a key part of Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman's Vision 2030, an attempt to diversify the economy away from oil. Joining us now from the conference is Bloomberg's Youssef Kamel al -Din. So, Youssef, what's going on? Well, Matt, uh, quite a bit of a buzz here, all the movers and shakers from mining and minerals and the conversations we've had, not just with Barrick, but also with Lucid Motors and many others kind of point to the fact that inflation and supply chain issues are still going to be front and center. I was speaking to Andrew Leverus just moments ago, the chairman of Lucid, saying, yeah, they're still struggling with that, trying to figure a way through there. But he's nonetheless positive in terms of the promises that were made to actually deliver. He wasn't able to actually disclose any numbers. The other takeaway from here is around natural gas price volatility, energy price volatility broadly. That's not going to be sustainable. When I spoke to the Egyptians, the minister was like, hey, it's good news for us, but it's actually bad news in terms of making this a reliable long-term play for either buyers or sellers. Right. Uh, it really We're certainly familiar with that volatility in gas markets here in Europe uh, as things stand this winter, uh, Yusuf. What is it that the Saudis want to get out of this uh, conference, the first major mining conference taking place there? We know of them for oil, of course. But what is it that the Saudis want to be when it comes to, to mining? And is this being driven uh, by concerns around oil not being an appealing asset for many ESG-motivated investors? How, how is this going to play out? You hit the nail on the head, Anna, and that is really that Saudi Arabia wants to be a platform for a lot of these global players. They have a very ambitious growth plans all the way to 2030 and beyond, and mining and minerals are an important component of that. I think we traditionally think of sort of energy and oil and gas, but the story is much, much bigger th than that, and the fact that you have these global names come here and actively, A, invest, and also 
provide the context that it's an important component of the global portfolios. This is not just sort of a stop on the way to Singapore. This is actually a focus, a primary focus for a lot of these companies. There's still a lot to be built, a lot to be developed, and that kind of partnership is what the Saudis here are kind of laying the groundwork for once again. Yusuf, it strikes me that you're there in person in Riyadh at this conference. This is an in-person event at a time when a lot of other conferences, Davos, for example, which was supposed to be happening within the next week, have been pushed back or moved online. What's the feeling like on the ground there? I mean, look, getting here was uh, was tricky. Uh, lots of documentation. I, I thought I'd never get through it from PCR tests to apps to disclosure forms to the visa to the conference badge. But then once you get through the airport and here at the conference, uh, there's an interesting vibe. Uh, it has a little bit of a pre-COVID feel to it with masks, so a little bit less distancing on the whole. But mask wearing is still generally done. Uh, it's, it's also a bit weird when you approach people because they don't know whether to shake hands or to fist bump or to stay afar. Uh, and again, it's people from all around the world and all kinds of interpretations and rules. Uh, but we're trying to figure out the cocktail as we go and hopefully we'll stay safe. Well, yes, we all hope that you stay safe and we're glad you made it there despite all of the hoops to jump through. Thank you so much to Bloomberg's Yusef Kamal Aldin at that conference in Riyadh. Now let's take a look at what else we're watching today. And we've been talking about it all show, guys. I am watching CPI data dropping at 8.30 a.m. Eastern time. We know we are expecting a seven handle on consumer price inflation. My question really is, how is the market going to react to that? Given we already have yields about a quarter of a percent higher than they were just 10 days ago. We also have expectations for a Fed hike in March really being pulled forward now pretty much entirely priced in and we saw with last the last CPI print that actually it coming in in right at expectations not hotter than expectations was actually taken as a downside surprise so it'll be really interesting to see how the equity and bar bond markets react to that number yeah absolutely um, and it's interesting that we expect it to continue right Bloomberg economics forecast I think 7.2 percent mm. for January I'm watching there's a kid a 19 year old kid um, Colombo is the guy's name interestingly enough for those of us who are older than 19 that's the name of a uh, famous detective um, David Colombo says that he was able to take control of 25 Teslas through hacking worldwide in 13 different countries he said he could uh, unlock the doors roll down the windows start the car tell if there was a person in the car turn on the stereo flash the lights not sure if he could actually accelerate or brake but it seems like at least from his perspective that it's pretty dangerous and it's very interesting because Tesla actually pays hackers to find these kind mm. of software vulnerabilities. So it could be a payday for 19 year old David Colombo, but probably a bummer for those um, who are in Tesla's and worried about security or, you know, on a bigger level for those who are in modern cars, because mm. it's not just yes. Tesla's. Remember years ago, someone hacked into a Jeep and was able to accelerate and brake while the car was moving from outside. So um, it looks yeah, like every cars time. are still hackable. Every time we hear these kind of stories, Matt, it does make many people, yeah, just nervous about the way that cars are evolving, I suppose, mm -hmm. in the future and their level of connectivity and therefore the risks that could go along with that. I like to see that he was doing the responsible thing and liaising with Tesla as to how he did it. But that's, you know, I may be um, too, much, too grown up uh, on that front. Uh, let me talk about UK assets. Perhaps they won't move on the back of the UK politics story, but there's certainly a lot of UK politics to talk about. Prime Minister Boris Johnson under more pressure than he's been for months and months over whether he did or didn't attend a party in May 2020. That's when we were only allowed to meet one person outside. And at, the, at that time, it seems as if a party was arranged at his residence in the garden. But still, um, will, uh, what will we hear today at Prime Minister's Questions? It is normally a very lively affair, as for those interested in UK politics, might be worth tuning in. What will this do to his political fortunes? Will he be able to hold on as Prime Minister? Now, more Bloomberg surveillance is ahead. We'll hear from Elsa Lignos of RBC Capital Markets and Sebastian Page of T. Rowe Price, among others. This is Bloomberg.